Poke the Bear is brought to you by Price Picks and the Game Time app. And welcome into Poke the Bear, episode 253, presented by Prize Picks and Game Time Tickets. My name is Connor Ryan, and once again, after what feels like months, years even, I am joined by the esteemed 98.5 The Sports Hubs, Ty Anderson. Ty, what's up? I mean, listen, that's all on you. You decided that's to true. go on yeah. like a jungle safari and, and everything else, which congrats, by the way, on, on oh, that. Thank you. Not getting married, just just seeing like lions and stuff. Like, I don't yeah. care about you getting married. Like, I thought it was gonna. <laughs> I thought it was gonna be congrats about getting out of Jumanji. Like, I rolled the right. I rolled the right <laughs> die. I ducked the the dude with the gigantic elephant gun. I, I avoided all that. Mm-hmm. Didn't turn into a, a primate uh, cretin like the that annoying little kid in that movie. Oh, it's right. gonna happen. That could still happen. Don't you worry. Shit, you know how bad it's gonna be if I show up to the golf tournament, like, and, and I just I just have like a, a chimp face. Like it, it, it's. I always think of like imagine if because I think way back when didn't they like let like some media if they wanted to take part in the tournament? It sounds like the worst thing ever. Like if you're talking about like first impressions, clean slate, New Year. Imagine like just like immediately just like missing off the tee just to start the year. Yeah, in front of the entire team. Like it, you're done. I wouldn't yeah. show up again. No, it's it, it's very much <laughs> like you. It's like that episode of The Office where Andy is golfing with Jim and the other guy, and it's just like a nightmare. Like I don't, yes. I don't want that. Like yeah. no, I. Yeah, yeah. The golf tournament this year took seven and a half hours because uh, I was so bad at it. Yeah, no, I would never. I could never. Like there are yeah. some things like I'd be like, yeah, I'd be, I'd be okay doing that around them. The golf, no, I would not be okay doing that around. No. them. And if you show up with a chimp face, even if it's like a one week kind of breakout thing, I'm like, yeah, sorry guys, like I, I mix my medications, I. I look mm. like Mighty Joe Young. Like, you don't recover from that. You don't come back the next week and be like, I'm fine. But no. So the closest thing I have to something like that is um, I was having really bad vision issues. Uh, I want to say like six, seven years ago. Like, I would be driving and I like couldn't see out of my left eye. And I'm like, what the hell is happening here? So I went to the doctors and they checked me for like vertigo and some other things. And they were like, you just have really bad vision in your left eye. I was like, really? So they did like the out whole eye exam. But when they do that, they like put something in your eyes and they make your like pupils like super big. Mm-hmm. And so that night there was a Bruins game and I showed up you with like pure, like pure black eyes basically almost. And somebody after the game, I was like doing just post game stuff. Someone was like, dude, what happened to your face? I'm like, I don't know, man. Just, <laughs> just don't worry about it right don't now. Look at I just want to ask about Please. the power play. <laughs> <clears throat> just have like I the full, remember. yeah. Just have the like the Phantom of the Opera, the Elephant Man mask on as you're walking in, dude. I, I, sh- I feel like I should have been wearing sunglasses all night. <clears throat> it's understandable. So again, I'm back in one piece. I don't have a chimp face. I'm not maimed, not mauled, anything like that. So happy to be back talking hockey with you, Ty. Unfortunately, we're at the point of the off season where not a lot is still going on, which is quite mm-hmm. terrible. Um, however, I will say, give props to you that you were able to, uh, talk to Jeremy Swayman last weekend as he's doing a triathlon or whatever the hell that is. I guess it's what people do in their spare time. All the props to him for doing that. I can't even run in a straight line. So, um, kudos to, uh, the restricted free agent, Jeremy Swayman. Um, and I'll kind of let you, you know, the floor is your Senator in terms of what you kind of took from his comments about. Um, you know, again, doesn't seem like it's anything in terms of raising the alarms in terms of this this negotiation, which has been prolonged, but I don't see it hitting a snag or anything like that. It seems like it's kind of status quo from what we expect from an RFA negotiation. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing I took away and the biggest things that the biggest thing that Bruins fans should take away is that he's really not worried. It doesn't seem in terms of getting a deal done. I don't think he has any doubt. I, I think he said things that allow his camp to to basically still have some some leverage, so to speak, in terms of like, I hope it's with the Bruins. But at the end of the day, I think the most telling comment is the first one, which is, I know it's going to get done eventually. And that's in reference to a contract. I, I, he's not sitting here in the complete unknown, toiling in uncertainty. I think it's just... Yeah, these take time. Go back to 2017, David Pasternak. Didn't happen until, I think, after conditioning uh, testing. I think on day yeah. one is when when that happened, and he was there by day two. And so 
I think it's kind of following a similar trend. We're starting to see some contracts get done. Matty Beniers obviously being a big one out in Seattle. What a steal. Uh, an unbelievable contract value. Um, but I do think we're kind of down to the big three, so to speak. Lucas Raymond, Mo Sider, Jeremy Swayman. It was the, the big four. Now we're at the big three. And so I think it gets done. And clearly Jeremy thinks it gets done, you know, uh, in the not too distant future. So I just think that like the, the negotiations haven't hit that point where someone is blinking and saying, I want to play hockey. And yeah. I think that's what it's going to take because that's how these deals tend to get done. One side goes, all right, enough. Let's just get this done. And yeah. I think that's kind of where we're trending. I think the biggest thing that I took away, Connor, was that I asked him straight up, do you want a long-term deal or are you open to a bridge deal? Because I do think that's potentially a question for the Bruins. Are they not completely sold on him? I would be, but if they're not, do they want to see more? He didn't want to touch that con- that that question. He said, that's a question for my agent. I don't want to, I like, I don't know. And so if I'm the Bruins, I'm avoiding a bridge deal because A, let's get it done. I don't want to run the risk of him walking away as a UFA. And B, I I don't think that you want to open that Pandora's box. And let's say he is what he was during the playoffs. And now he's going to cost 10 and a half million after Igor gets his contract, after Ottinger gets his contract. Like, I don't think the price is going to go down for a goalie. I think we're entering the new era where teams are going, oh, no, we need a stud goalie. Like, a stud goalie gets you far, you know? Mm -hmm. And so... I just get it done. Just get it done. Deal with it being a high percentage of your cap in years one, two, maybe three. But just get it done long term if I'm the Bruins. Yeah, I feel like it's a no brainer for the Bruins in terms of locking him up long term. Because as you said, like you look at again where the projections are with the the cap and how much it's supposed to jump up. You know, it already jumped up quite a bit this year. It should the next couple of years as well. If you're kind of riding that wave, now should be the time where you lock up a lot of guys and the Bruins have generally done that, right? Like you look at how good the Pasternak deal is going to look in a couple of years, the McAvoy deal, like all these guys that are going to be paid at market rate or even below that in the next couple of years. If you're skeptical about giving, you know, Swayman, I don't know, say 8 million per year. And you look at, as you said, what's going to happen in a couple of years when Shesterkin's do and Ottinger and all these other guys, you should kind of be the first one in the door there, lock him in long-term. And again, as you said, maybe for a year or two, you're like, all right, like that, that's maybe kind of a high percentage. You know, we still have question marks over whether he's the guy, but even if he's not a, a Vesna finalist or something, but if he's a top five, top 10 goalie even, which you hope he's kind of more than that, but uh, you look at what a lot of these goalies are probably going to be paid as kind of the, the market rate going forward once the cap ends up being 95, 96, 97 million. Uh, it's all going to more or less fall in line. So even if maybe you are, you have those concerns. And I guess it's valid for a team to kind of go leave no stone on turn when it comes to these bigger deals, but kind of rough to read the tea leaves of what the the state of the NHL and the state of the cap is going to be in the next couple of years. If that's what you're hesitant about, just, just sign them to the contract. Don't, don't freak out over it. If that's what it's going to be. I think maybe the, the one thing I am fascinated when the news eventually hits in terms of what this deal and when, you know, when they sign it, it'll be like, we'll get a, a tweet at, like 1045 of just Jeremy Swingman's face. And that's kind of like the bat signal, knowing that shit's about to hit the fan. Uh, oh, I would yeah. be fascinated to see what exactly the, um, the actual final AAV is on the deal. Cause again, you can make the case that it's seven and a half, eight and a half. Is you looking for more than that? You know, is that what the, the holdup is? Um, but I think whatever he ends up being, when you look at just how dominant he was down the stretch last year, his age, the fact that he has made strides every single year, um, there's just a lot to like about, you know, I, I don't think you have to really uh, twist someone's arm in order to get them to agree to a deal where it's eight years at eight million plus or something like that. Now, if we get to like nine or nine and a half, then I can see the Bruins like dragging this out a little bit. But as well, I don't see any cause for concern or panic as to these negotiations like going completely south or anything like that. Yeah. And, and I think you have to kind of look at, you know, recent contracts for for um for goaltenders the connor hellebuck one is 8.5 Ilya sorokin's 8.25 i believe yeah. uh saros is what 7.8 just under mm-hmm. so <clears throat> you look at it from that standpoint like if you give him that kind of contract let's just say he's between saros and sorokin or or sorokin and he are tied at 8.25 like 
That's top five, top six goalie money. That's kind of where he is, I think, in the league. I, I think he's I, I don't think he's a top five guy. I disagree with the NHL Network's rankings just a touch. Um, but I do think he is in the top six. I think you can really kind of fiddle about um, you know, with your top six. Um, but he's in that range. You know, he's a he's a high end six, a low end four, you know, when his game is going. So I think paying him that, like, it's going to age well. And this is something that I think people in 2024 have a harder time seeing because they're looking at it in the now. They're analyzing it in the now. If you give Jeremy Swayman $8 million, but it carries him through his prime years, you know, his 27, 28, 29 years, and you get that at $8 million, by those years, it's going to be the standard contract for a starting goaltender in the NHL, in my opinion. I, I firmly mm-hmm. believe that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I even think you look at, I think it's only natural for Bruins fans to always expect the worst with these things. When you hear any comments, you, ha- you have the people being like, oh, like the Bruins should have signed him earlier. Or it's like, oh, the Bruins are, are going to let this guy walk or anything like that, which people just I don't understand that if you're a restricted free agent, there are restrictions in place. So I, I just also think you look at it like even if this thing, you know, if we're a day into training camp and he's not signed, I can be like, well, it's not kind of great. But still, I think you look at the fact the Bruins have, I think Bruins cap space has them at $9.3 million. It'd be a lot easier if cap friendly wasn't uh, carved off and used by like five jabronis in the Capitals office and ruining it for everyone. But like the Bruins have a little bit of leeway in terms of their cap space that they could accommodate if maybe it's above what the initial projections are. So I think when you factor that in, you factor, uh, I don't really see an offer sheet coming. I know people are freaked out about that. Um, because of the the Oilers and the Blues, even though that was for, what, a couple million? I don't see a team ponying up for Swayman at this stage of the offseason when a lot of spending has already been done. Um, I just look at the the state of the team. Yes, like even if this drags on a little bit longer and we get into training camp and it's not ideal, I can't see it hitting DEFCON 1 where all of a sudden we're in a spot where it's, this team doesn't enter the year with Jeremy Swayman as their number one on a hefty new contract moving forward. Yeah, and, and I think that's really – that's where I land as well. Now, the doomsday here, Connor, is that worth noting that Swayman's agent is the same agent who reps William Nylander. Mm-hmm. William Nylander, who is the owner of what was the longest contract dispute in the salary cap era. Yep. era he held out basically until the deadline – that he had to sign by or miss the entire season. What was that two years ago? I, yes, I want to say. I yeah. So. Um, so does his agent dig in and basically say, okay, well we want our value. And if it's not us, it's Corpus Allo and Brandon Bussey. Have fun with that. I don't think it happens to that point, but it's really comes back to how much does Swayman trust his agent? He said that again and again and again, but does it hit the point where Swayman says to his agent, I just want to play. I just want to play, man. Let's get me in there. I want to play. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that is a doomsday scenario. Uh, I think we have not uh, been very high on the Corpus Allo train so far. So that would not be ideal if that's your opening night uh, starter in in Florida, if it ever gets to that point. So we'll see how that all kind of plays out. Uh, Ty, we have more to talk about about the Bruins. But before we do, let's take a quick break. Hear from our good friends over at Prize Picks. Team USA's run in Paris has come to an end, but rejoice, sports fans, because football season is about to begin. And there's so many ways for you to get in the action and win up to 100 times your cash on prize picks. As you and the world's best players take the game to a new level on the court, baseball diamond, gridiron, and much more. Prize picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. With prize picks, you can turn $10 into $1,000 in a single game watching your favorite sports this fall. You can make a prize picks lineup in less than a minute. You just need to pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and you're locked in. And unlike other apps, on prize picks, it's just you against the numbers. Sign up today and get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Preseason football is underway, but you can pick more or less on 2024 season stats already on prize picks. Will Patrick Mahomes throw for more or less than 4,300 yards? Will C.J. Stroud's sophomore season result in more or less 4,150 yards? Enter your season picks before week one kicks off. There's really no shortage of ways to participate in prize picks. 
This football season, I'm picking Tyreek Hill for more than 1,376 yards and Saquon Barkley for more than 1,050 rushing yards. So download the Prize Picks app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. That's code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, run your game. Now, let's get back to the show. Shout out once again to Prize Picks. All right, Ty, we've, uh, I think, covered all the bases of the tangible news that we've covered over the last week. So now we're all up to, as what the kids say, checking the vibes, because we are a few weeks away from the start of training camp. I know it's like September 18th is the official stop, but I think we're going to have captain's practice a lot earlier than that. So excited to kind of actually get get underway here in the next couple of weeks. So as we kind of lead into that and get through these very boring final weeks of the off season, um, again, love how it is where the Stanley Cup final ends. We go through a maelstrom for 10 days and then just nothing happens for six, seven, eight weeks. It's a lot of fun to go through every single year. Um, but I think just overall looking at this team right now with the assumption that we're not going to have any dramatic developments with Swayman. He eventually puts pen to paper, even if it's a few days in a training camp. What's your general take on how you feel about this team going into this new year and maybe what the expectations should be set for this team in terms of how they're hopefully building off of what last year was? Yeah, I, I think winning the division is very much in play for this team. I, I, I just think that they were a great team a year ago, and I, I'm going to stick by they were a great team. I, I don't think their record was fool's gold. I thought they had some good wins against some quality opponents. Now there were teams they struggled against for they struggled against for sure. The Rangers come to mind there on that front. Um, even Tampa, you know, still gave them some problems a year ago. However, um, they proved that they could hang with some of the better teams in their conference in the league for that matter a year ago. Now you bring in Zadorov, you bring in Lindholm. Um, I just think you're a deeper team in terms of, of how you can win games. Um, now scoring is going to be a big question mark. They lost some guys that, that scored some, some goals for them a year ago. Um, you got to see who, who takes that second line, you know, job, but this is a team that I think has proven that for 82 games, their core and their foundation is strong enough to, to be an upper echelon team. Um, now, when we get beyond that, that's where things get interesting. My ceiling for this team is low-end second round, high-end third round. I, I don't know if they have the goods to get beyond that, but the East is kind of wide open right now, it feels like. You know, there are teams that I look at and say, ooh, took a step back. You know, I, I and I begin with Florida, man. Like, Florida, I, I love what they can do. They've played a lot of hockey the last two years, and you just wonder about that, right? Like the legs are going to be heavier in, in March and April. Um, it's very rare to go on three straight deep runs. Like it's just, it's just hard, right? Yeah. And they lost some guys. Um, Tampa, I don't love their center depth. I really don't. Um, it goes like that. It really does. Oh my goodness. Um, and even Sorelli, like I liked him, but, I, I thought he kind of took a step back a year ago. Like I, I, I didn't feel like he was in, as impactful when I was watching their games and I may have picked the wrong games to watch, but that's just how I felt. Um, and so it's like, yeah, they're still a top three team, top two team in their division. The Bruins I'm talking about now, like mm -hmm. it's just like you want to get out of the second round. You don't want to like have progress and stall. And, and I think that's kind of where we're at right now. So I think coming out of the Atlantic bracket, I think that's a fair expectation when you drop 80 million on July one for two guys. Like, I think that's a fair expectation that you have to either lose in game seven of the second round or get out of the second round. I think that's where I'm at right now. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely fair expectation in terms of second round, very competitive series. And again, like there was a, you have to give them credit for as much as I think like Florida was clearly the best team. They played them pretty tough. And you look at just, I think, the DNA and the the fact that you've added some more guys that should help you in these playoff games, right? You have a guy in Zadorov where we know what he brings uh, on the ice. You've got a guy in Lindholm who's great defensively who can take some of those daunting matches while also being a guy that, especially on the power play, like has a knack for generating a lot of shots from the slot, which 
you kind of need another guy that can kind of be in that sweet spot there in the Lindholm. So he's a guy that, again, in terms of setting expectations, I don't know if you're expecting the the 40 goal, 82 point season from Calgary, but I think you can make a case for another 60 point season for this guy if he's riding, you know, if he's stapled to David Pasternak's hip on the power play and on the top line at five and five play. Um, there's a lot to like about that group. There's a lot to, I think, even like about further down the lineup. Um, you know, it remains to be seen where exactly guys kind of slot in. But, like, if your fourth line is guys like Kastelik and Max Jones and, like, Johnny Beecher, three guys who average height is, like, 6'3", 215, skate really well. Uh, Jones and Kastelik draw a shit ton of penalties. Like, you've got all of a sudden a pretty heavy line there that if you're looking for, like, that, you know, I feel like the prototypical fourth line now is, like, what Carolina's had. If you can find, like, another, like, Martin Nook, and maybe that's a high end projection there, but those kinds of players, you have guys that, you know, can uh, land well against opponents, do a little bit of everything. Um, and then even if your third line, however it pans out, whether it's, you know, Geeky or Frederick or Potra or anyone else like that, it does seem like uh, as much as this team is kind of, you're still waiting to see how it all sorts out. And there's the obvious question marks about, you know, the top six wing who steps in there. It does seem like there's a lot of guys that are either due for bounce back years in terms of a guy like Lindholm or guys that should continue to take steps forward. Now, how big a step forward? That remains to be seen. Like, I don't know if you're projecting like Frederick for 25 goals or if like Geeky has a 50 point season or anything like that. I don't know about that. But you do look at like Zaka on the wing with the strongest supporting cast. Uh, Geeky, another year in Boston. Frederick. Uh Mason Lorai, who's in a third pairing role, should get more second power play reps, like even Potra, someone like that. You know, I think every year when I go into the season, and this is kind of how it was two years ago for the record setting year, and you just looked at the team, and I don't think anyone expected them to be a record setting team, but if you're setting expectations, you're like, all right, what has to go right for this team to be good? Like looking at each individual player, and you didn't have to like, really dig deep to be like, all right, if Taylor Hall is on the third line, he can actually do really good in that spot. Like, all right, if these guys do good in this spot, if Jake DeBrusque, you know, is in this spot and plays well, you also have the sum of your parts as being playing at a very, very high level. Not to say this team is going to have 118 points or anything like that, but you just look at where they put guys in spots to succeed and what we saw last year and the general expectation of building off of that. It does seem like a team that there should be multiple guys kind of pulling on that rope and, taking steps forward that as a whole should help you out. And again, you've got the, the vacancy up in the top six. You've got the question marks over Corpus Allo and, and losing all mark and the expected regression there. But I think it's fair to assume that a lot of guys are going to take, even if it's incremental steps forward, that overall helps the, the overall body of work with this team moving forward. Yeah, and and you bringing up all mark there, I think is really interesting because, uh, you know, I was curious in terms of like, okay, when – when Bob Asenza took over in 2003, the Bruins really haven't had like legitimately bad goaltending. Yeah. I'd say maybe one or two years. Um, and I don't know if that was him as much as it was the people that he was trying to coach up. And so what, what, how many games do you think that uh, Jonas Corposalo is going to play if he's having a successful year? Probably what? At least 25, at least 25, 25 30, 30 is high mock maybe. Right. Like, yeah. And so I went and looked this up because I was curious. In the 21 years, right, that Bob Asenza has been the goaltending coach, he came to the team in 2003, uh, there's only been one one goalie out of, I think, 100, I want to say, who's played at least 25 games in a season and had a sub-900 save percentage. That was Andrew Raycroft in 2005, 2006, behind what was a terrible team. Yeah. So yeah. for him to be the disaster he was in Ottawa, it would take something that we haven't seen in almost 20 years. And so, mm -hmm. but that's the big question. Like if they can't fix him and there are things that I think go beyond just mechanics, he struggled with distance from shot uh, shots from distance last year. Mm -hmm. He get, gave up the first goal on the first or second shot a ton last year. Um, and that's, that might be internal. Like that might be like, Hey, we got to get your vision, right? We got to get your mentality, right? If you can't fix those things, then we're talking about that regression that you're mentioning, like that serious regression where you're hoping that Bussy is ready. And I got to be honest, I'm not ruling out the possibility of them beginning the year with three goaltenders or 
beginning the year waving Corpus Allo down to the minors, knowing that nobody's going to claim him, making mm-hmm. three million for the next four years, and giving the job to Bussy out of the gate, seeing if you can take a calculated risk where he either takes a job or he stinks and no one's going to claim him off waivers. Like, right. so, so I think the backup goalie position is going to be the biggest question because think about it. Like the last time this team missed the playoffs, it's because they had to ride to Rask into the ground. And, yeah. And, and so that is the question. Like Swayman's younger. I think his body may be more built to handle like the grind, but you need 13, 14 wins out of that backup position, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and if you don't get that, okay, well, there's 15 points you're leaving on the board, right? And mm-hmm. does that affect everything we're talking about right now? Yeah, absolutely. No, that is one of gonna, going to be one of the key things in terms of the backup goalie uh, spot and, and where those things shake out and hopefully be pleasantly surprised with the strides that Corpus Salo can make. Again, Bob Basenza has quite the track record, but – this might be his most daunting project yet in terms of going into the year. Um, we'll have more to talk about, about looking at other things to look forward to this upcoming season tie, but let's take one more quick break here from our friends over at Game Time Tickets. Fall is beginning, which means football is back. And nothing beats a college football atmosphere. With both college and NFL games, who doesn't love a good tailgate? Get to the game with Game Time. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks. That makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play live even easier. And Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. This fall, my friends and I are going to the Patriots-Titans game in Tennessee. How will we get tickets for the game? Game Time, of course. The Super Deal has been amazing to us in the past, and there's no doubt it will be great to us again. I just love the curated deals, which make it easier to find the best price on great seats. Some other features I love are the lowest price guarantee, or Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Game Time picks. Curation makes it easier to save more on sports, comedy, and theater. All in pricing. Toggling this feature shows the total up front with no surprise fees at checkout. So, Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code CLNS for $20 off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? It's Game Time. Now, back to the show. Once again, shout out to Game Time Tickets. All right, Ty, looking ahead at this upcoming year, what else are you excited to kind of see play out or a storyline maybe worth following uh, with this Bruins team in 2024-25? Yeah, I mean, I hate to go spicy right away, but I, I got to know if Merkulov or Lysel can make this team because if they don't, I feel like things might get a little messy, you know, in terms of like how that player feels about being sent down to Providence for it would be a third or fourth year. Uh, I think that's really worth monitoring. I don't know if we're quite in Koklachev territory, but we might be, you, you know, like with these guys, if they don't make it. And so that's an inter- interesting, you know, side topic here, side side quest, whatever you want to call it. Like, because if they make the team, they're going to be relied upon in a pretty substantial role. Um, either second line or third line scoring, you, you know, that's going to be their role, I think. So that's what I'm really interested in watching. And also just the different, the different sort of combos you can create on the back end. I, we've talked about this now for, for about a month and a half, but I don't know what their pairings are going to be. But what I do know is that they have their most competitive mix in terms of the six that they can build and, and different styles of pairings they can build um, in years. I, I think that on all three sides, I'm up all two sides, rather you have three guys that can move up and down and you can put them with this guy to soup up the offense or load up on defense, load up on size, load up on reach, nasty, whatever. Like that's really interesting in my opinion is like how you build your defense like you'd no longer have a guy that you look at and go, Oh, can't really put him there. You know, yeah. like, like with Grizzly and with Forbert, um, with Saboro, even before that, like there are guys that you had to almost like hyper manage. I don't think you have that with this current complexion. 
Yeah, no, I agree. And I agree with looking at the younger players. And I think the most important thing is just finally getting some clarity here. You know, we've, and it's popular thing to talk about, like the Bruins bringing in like guys on PTO deals and stuff like that. And if there's like one or two guys you're interested in seeing if they have whatever's left in the tank, sure. But I don't want this team bringing in like another four or five guys and blocking a guy like Lysel or Merkulov. And again, like if they don't work, then they don't work. But now is the time to see what you have in these guys. Because if they do hit, and all of a sudden you have this vacancy somewhere on the wing, and a guy like Lysel can roll with it, um, who's never had a chance before, who's, I think, kind of proven everything he can down in Providence. It's not like, you know, a few years ago, and like, remember during Dev Camp when they talked about Merkulov, and you're like, yeah, his defense got to, they got to work on his defense. And I was like, what the fuck was he doing down there? Like, <laughs> my God. Like, right. again, you had those c- concerns about the, the two way game with Lysel, you know, maybe the the day to day, like the consistency, the effort, those kinds of things. You hear like uh, Mujanel talking about him uh, this past Dev Camp. Seems like he's ready to make a jumper. They they think he is, and so, all right, you are talking up this guy who's viewed as kind of your most promising prospect still down in the in the farm system. See what you have in him. Like even if you you go through these games where there's going to be bumps along the way, maybe. His first preseason game, he takes a penalty and plays 12 minutes and isn't that impactful. Roll him back out there. See what he can do. Like, I'd rather you find out now. It's almost like I'd rather you be in, like, late November, early December, and, like, you've given Lysel 20 games. And if he has two goals and four assists and he's not making an impact, it sucks. But, you know. Same mm-hmm. with like Merkulov. We learned absolutely jack shit from his limited time last year, which was a waste for everyone involved in terms of this guy that's viewed as a middle six kind of playmaking guy. Put him on the fourth line, playing him eight minutes a night. It's not going to do anything. Like I'd rather you find out what these guys have and either are encouraged and you, you build them through the system and you give him more reps and all of a sudden he's a guy that becomes a key cog of your team. Uh, he either is that, maybe he's more of just a guy that, is a solid everyday NHLer, which I think you'll also take. If he's not, then you finally know. And if that's the case, and we're in December and you're trying to find a guy, you know, you either can uh, bump up a guy like Geeky or Frederick or what have you, maybe as a contingency plan, or again, get to the trade deadline. Every single year, there's a 15, 20 goal scorer, multiple ones out on the market and you address it there. But I'd rather you find out now what you have in these kinds of players than once again, kicking the can, uh, you know, down the road or seeing projecting what he could be in a couple of years. Like now is the time where there is a vacancy to brusque isn't back um, to see what you have in these players and just finally figure out what you have moving forward. I think we know what we have in Lori of, you know, maybe we don't know what his ceiling is, but you know, he's an everyday NHL player who can be pretty impactful. We saw Patra, like, again, remains to be seen how you're setting expectations for him this year because they do have the option of putting him in Providence. So I think he needs more seasoning, but looks like a guy that has the poise to be an everyday NHL player. Let's find out what Lysel can do and then move forward from there. Because if he does hit, and this is a guy that can give you 15 goals as a rookie in a featured role, that'd be a great break for the Bruins going into this year. Oh, 100%. Now, that said, I'm I'm not against bringing in a PTO guy if it makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think they should extend two PTOs. I, I think you kind of do eat it a year ago. You bring in Heinen and Cheyasan, and then you cut Cheyasan after what was it like one preseason game? I think he got think one so. game, and the power yeah. play with him on net front was terrible. And they were like, "All right, no, no, yeah, you're you're gone, you're cooked." Um, something like that. Like I'm not against it. You know, I know there's been there's been rumblings of Blake Wheeler. Um, I, I again. I, I'm not against that. They, were, I know they were interested interested in him in 2023 before he picked the Rangers. Um, I believe they actually offered more money than, than mm-hmm. New York did because they wanted to, they wanted to get him. And then they brought in JVR. Like even JVR, you bring him in a PTO. I, if you can't outwork a 36 year old JVR, Fabian yeah, Lysel, then exactly. I don't know what to tell you. You like so I I like that idea and I do think they will do that. They have typically done that in the past where. They want to see you outwork somebody, right? And they don't like to guy, have guys inherit spot, inherit uh, minutes and opportunities. Like they want them to earn it. And so we'll see if they do that. But yeah, like to your point, like we have an interminably long preseason and training camp. Utilize that to put these guys in spots to win jobs. I hated how they used Lysel a year ago. I hated it. I think, mm-hmm. I, I think his first preseason game. 
he was playing with like two guys that we knew were going to be in the minors. Like I, yeah. I think I want to say it was something like Curtis Hall and like it was like no, it's like Jason Megna and Anthony Richard. And you're like, okay, this is Providence's second line, I guess. You're like, right. It, yeah. it felt useless, right? And so, yeah, I I want to see Lysel with Marshan. I want to see Merkulov with Zaka. Like I I like I I want to see these things at some point just to know if there's chemistry, you know, if it works. Um and reassess from there. You know, like there are guys available, but ideally you don't want to have to sign, you know, a Philip Zadina or or a 37-year-old Blake Wheeler or Kevin LeBanc. Like you you want your guys to shine. Mm-hmm. And when you have a six-game preseason and you have a training camp that lasts three and a half weeks, like you you better use it to find out what you got internally, in my opinion. Yeah, no, absolutely. It'll, I think it'll definitely be the, the top thing to watch for. And again, it'll just be exciting seeing the guys back out there seeing these new additions that they have signed in for agency, but I think the young guys and what they can roll with moving forward is going to be fascinating to see uh, during training camp, which, thank God, Ty, it's only just a couple weeks away. We're almost there. We're almost at the finish line before we start the longer season, but uh, excited to get back there very, very soon. Um, as we brace for the start of the new year, uh, where can we read your stuff, Ty? Where can we hear you on the airwaves, the podcasting? Where, yeah. where can we find it all? Uh, you can find it at 985thesportsub.com. Uh, Sports Hub Underground is the podcast. Uh, radio, I'm not sure what we got cooking up yet. I have no idea. I haven't been told much of anything. Hockey show will be back soon. Um, I don't know what my role is on that in terms of like, I, there's a lot of moving parts. You know, Judd yes. Surratt is now the new Nesson uh, play-by-play guy, so who knows what's going to happen there. Um, yeah, uh, and then you can find me on X at underscore Ty Anderson. Uh, and you can just find me walking around Brighton Alston. So if you see me, say hi. Why not? What about yourself? No. Yes, uh, you can find me on. Uh, you can find me in Southie, I guess. I'll probably <laughs> the Duncan on uh, Ellen Broadway. I'm usually there most times. So please come up and say hi. Don't frighten me though, because I'm brave. Headphones in. Uh, you can also find me on X at Connor Ryan underscore ninety three, and you can read my stuff over at Boston.com and the Boston Globe, where I've covered every step of the way this Bruins season from training camp to October to hopefully May and hopefully June as well. So, uh, Ty, thank you for coming on the show once again. Uh, This is episode 253 of Poke the Bear. You fans have a great rest of your week.